Welcome everyone to this very timely presentation about the impact of the most powerful black swan event in modern history. Not since World War II has our country faced such a massive challenge. This presentation is critical knowledge, but it is not Netflix binge watching. I'm not here to scare you, but the fact that you're in this webinar means you're concerned about the effect of coronavirus on the economy, on your own wealth, on real estate, you want data, and more importantly, you want ideas on how you can safeguard your assets. So this webinar is for those of you that can handle the truth, because the truth's not gonna be fun. There's a big silver lining in there for real estate, but I can tell you up front, it's not huge, it's not immediate, and it's not across the board. So jump off now or steal yourself for the ugly truth. All right, you guys still with me? Okay, good. I'll start off with a super quick intro about me. I'm a guy who is super relieved that he has no investments in the stock markets or in hotels or airlines in particular, because the last week is, you know, last 10 days have wiped out about $7 trillion in wealth in the stock market. I live on the quiet little apartment real estate side of the pond where the investment is not as sexy or addictive as a stock market or startups. But boy, am I happy today to be the slow and steady turtle, not the speedy rabbit. These are some of our apartment and self storage communities. And when I look at this portfolio today, I thank myself for being in an industry where I have cash flow to push the very sharp pain that is about to come. And we've been checking our community's cash flow, and many of them can pay a year of mortgage even if their rents fall more than 50%. And this gives me a tremendous sense of belief that when we ignored high flying stock markets that seem to go up 30% a year without any effort and instead invested in really boring apartments, we did the right thing. We made the right call and our investors will be able to sleep at night knowing that our tenants still need a roof over their head. But before we get to the content, here's the really boring stuff that my lawyer forces on you. This is an educational webinar and doesn't squeeze out the risk in real estate investing. And my recommendations are not magic, they are my opinions. Do your own due diligence, consult professionals and understand that even if you do your research, you could still lose money. Real estate investing is a risk area. Okay, this presentation is split into two halves. The first half is about really understanding the pandemic, the worldwide events that are happening, and then the stuff that's happening in the US. Once we spend a few minutes on that, we will focus on the impact to, uh, to jobs. You know, we'll, we'll look at the key findings from the UCSF uh, Biohub, and we've anchored their findings into our presentation. They're kind of the basis of our presentation. And then we're gonna talk about the impact in your life, you know, full lockdown or not. And I think that we're getting close to knowing the answer to that. We're gonna talk about is the recession coming, um, you know, and what does that recession look like? We will talk then about real estate, a divided market. What is the impact to all the different sectors of real estate from student housing to senior housing to apartments to single family? We'll talk about all of those. And then we're gonna talk about impact on hotels, Airbnbs and stocks on, on the stock market in, in particular. And lastly, because many of you are in the apartment industry, we'll talk about asset management. If you're in apartments, how do you protect your communities? How do you protect your investors? So this isn't a presentation about coronavirus itself, but my job today is to shine a light on the impact of this deadly pandemic on real estate. But how do you do that without looking at the timeline of the crisis? Things started here on the top left, December 31st. Only 23 days after the outbreak, Wuhan, a city of more than 11 million people, was in quarantine. And only eight days later after that, right here, Jan 31st, the US restricted travel to China. And then on Feb 13th, in one day, one single day, there were 14,000 new cases in Hubei province. And the US stock market on that day was close to its all time highs, nearly 30,000 points for, for the Dow. That's a month ago, a little over a month ago. Seems like an eternity. Yep. Now on Feb 24th, the Trump administration asked for a billion dollars in aid, a billion dollars. That's a lot of money, right? Well, just 24 short days later, on March 17th, they asked for a trillion dollars. And today, one week later, that trillion dollars has now turned into two 
trillion. That's 2,000 billion. I hope you see the speed at which things change because unlike any enemy that we have fought in the past, Past. This is an enemy that can attack 193 countries at the same time, and it can force us to rethink our defense every single day. If this was the Avengers movie, this virus is the villain Thanos. And just like the movie, it is kicking our butt. We've never seen anything like it. Not in 2008, not in 2001, not in the oil crisis. Nothing in our history matches the incredible speed which with this enemy moves. So Going forward, each day will be different and this presentation will evolve. It lives at www.coronavirusrealestate.com and we'll be sending you updates as well. I recently read a very powerful report of conclusions from the UCSF Biohub panels. You see pictures of the panel members above. From left to right, we've got Iron Man, Black Widow, Captain Marvel, Hawkeye, <laughs> and a really geeky looking Bruce Banner. These are the real Avengers that are fighting this virus. And they shared some key findings with us. Now you've heard these before, so I'm only gonna take one minute to go after them, right? The first finding is super scary, right? And this number, by the way, this 40,000 is up to about 51,000 as of today. They say that containment, anything short of lockdown is not enough. All it does is slow the spread to months instead of weeks. That's really scary because what they're saying in a roundabout way is that we're looking at tens of millions or hundreds of millions of infections with the containment strategy, which is the, different from lockdown. Which leads us to their key finding number two and to this graph, which I'm sure everyone's seen by now, right? The flattening the curve graph. This is the opinion of this panel that our efforts now are not really focused on preventing people from becoming sick. It's focused on spreading out this infection over a longer period of time hoping against hope that a drug will be developed early and hoping that our healthcare system can cope with it. Note that this is just hope, so it's not a real strategy. And as soon as you say words like flattening the, the curve or words like social distancing, immediately dozens of you are going to start lecturing me about testing or the lack of testing. And that segues me right into their third finding. We're not testing enough. Bahrain and South Korea do 100 times more testing than the US. Now testing helps more at the beginning of a crisis than during the middle phase, and we're in the middle phase. For us, at this point, lockdowns are likely to be the solution. Key finding four, this is not the flu. It may come from the same or a similar family as the flu, but comparing this to the flu is like comparing a flea to an elephant. Firstly, its kill rates is 10 to 34 times higher than the flu. Secondly, the cost of hospitalization is 100 times higher. Why? Because the worst case need intensive care units and people stay on ventilators for many weeks. Uh, and here's the big one. The only country that has proof that this monster can be stopped is China. And they shut down their economies to stop it. And if we think that we've shut our economy down, then we're wrong. The impact of really shutting that down the economy is at least 100, 1,000 times the impact of the flu. So flea versus elephant. Key finding five was that our kids and infants don't get this virus. Thank God, because if they did, we'd be way, way better off. Keep in mind though, that the cost of keeping nearly 100 million kids out of school is in itself in the tens of billions of dollars because of the knock-on effects like childcare. Key finding um, six is that the virus targets older people. And the panel also commented that the millennials are the predominant carriers of this disease. They're the group that has been ignoring social distancing. And I wanted to show you this 60 second video about how dangerous that is. And Dr. Kong, because you're on the front lines, are you seeing lots of young people? Yes, we have actually seen a lot of young people. I, I want to echo what has already been said on your show that while it is true that mortality is associated with uh, more advanced age, that does not preclude younger people having serious disease. So we have seen people with serious disease requiring hospitalization. Um, this is absolutely something that we're seeing. I'll reiterate once again, of the studies that have been done so far, this is brand new, nearly half the patients who were admitted to the ICU were people younger than 65, which Dr. Gounder, I think, makes these images that we're about to show put up on the screen here so confounded and upsetting. It's these pictures of people on spring break in Florida on these crowded beaches. And then you hear statements like this, and I'll read this out loud. 
Uh, this is from someone from Miami yesterday. If I get corona, I get corona. I'm not going to let it stop me from partying. I think they're blowing it way out of proportion. How dangerous is a statement like that? It's insanely dangerous. And here's why. We're going to talk about quarantines. So we attract a lot of data-driven investors. And so you'll appreciate this dashboard. So this is the US and below that, you have all of these other blockbuster countries that have high infection count. And at the time, by the way, that this slide was written, we were at 33,000, we're now at 51,000. The thing to notice is not that other countries have more infections than us. The thing to notice is not that Italy is worse off than us, even though we've heard about the insane human tragedy there. The thing to notice, Everyone, every other country on this slide is better off than us. Why? Take a look at our five-day growth rate. Italy, 13. Spain, 20. South Korea, 1%. They're, they're an example of what, what to do right. Iran, 6%. United Kingdom, 24, 22, 16. And of course, China at this point, 0 0.05. Take a look at our daily growth rate. It's at 40%. Yesterday was significantly higher. Let me be blunt, no country in the world is doing as poor a job as us. Here's a graph that shows our infection count. And I haven't gotten yesterday in there, but it was 39,000. So it was the same curve. This is a clear exponential curve. The bad news is, is that the sharpest part of this curve has been in the last three or four days, which was after we implemented social distancing and travel restrictions, we closed bars, we did more testing. So. Magically, even if this rate slows down to, let's say, 30% a day, we will still have 210,000 Americans infected by the end of this month, and we're only six days away from that. And we'll have roughly 170 million Americans infected by the end of next month. 170 million infected. Of those, about 8 million would need ICU beds. That's roughly 8 million more ICU beds than we have. But the raw numbers don't matter. What matters is the daily growth rate. If you want to compare the US to Italy, here's the data-driven bottom line. We believe that within the next week, the remaining half of the US that is not in quarantine will go into quarantine. It's just a matter of time. So at this point, 148 million Americans are under some form of lockdown. Call it shelter in place, safer at home, whatever you want to call it. The numbers are showing us that the US is doing so poorly compared to any other country in the world that the remaining 160 odd million need to go into lockdown within a few days. We expect the lockdown to last many, many weeks. When I originally wrote this presentation, people mocked me for saying this. Today, I think a lot more of you will agree. So obviously that kind of a lockdown is going to tank our economy. Let's talk about the possibility of a recession. The folks at Green Street Advisors were one of the first to warn that the economic impact will be massive. And they also pointed out that this black swan event reduces the chance that Trump will get reelected. So that's interesting. Jan Hatzius, the chief economist at Goldman Sachs, warned about an extraordinarily sharp reduction in economic activity in March, April, and then possibly in May. They first forecast that Q2 GDP will be negative 5%. Then three days later, three days ago, they came back and reforecasted it. Take a look. This is their belief of US GDP, negative 24%. Wow. At no point in history have we ever had a quarter that was more than 8% negative. 8.3% was the third quarter of 2008. 8.3%. Goldman Sachs, minus 24. Morgan Stanley, minus 30%. That this second quarter that is starting will seem very dark, people. It's going to seem insanely dark. Unemployment, Morgan Stan Mor Goldman Sachs says, we're going to go from 3.5% to 9%. Morgan Stanley says 12.8%. And in a few minutes, I'll tell you why both of these numbers are wrong. They're both too low. But first, let's talk about a global recession. You see this guy here on the screen, Kevin Hassett. He was the top economist in the Trump administration. A while ago, he left. And he just did this video where this is what he said. He said, the odds of a global recession are close to 100% right now. 
Do you know that three days ago, the Trump administration rehired him? He's right now at the White House coordinating our, react, our, our reaction and our response to this global recession. Let's listen to him for a minute. You worked in the Trump White House. You were his lead economist. Treasury Secretary Mnuchin is downplaying the risk of a recession. Former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers says 85 to 90 percent chance there is a recession and it won't be mild. And Gary Cohn, who worked with you at the White House, says we're already in a recession. Are we in or heading to a recession? Right. You know, I think that the odds of a global recession are close to 100 percent right now. I wow. think in the U.S., it's we're going to have a very terrible second quarter. You know, we just uh, at the Lindsay Group, we just ran the numbers carefully over the weekend. And we think second quarter is going to be about minus 5 percent. And we think the jobs number in early April might be you know, as much as minus a million or so, uh, because there are going to be a lot of people. Like, no, there nobody, uh, nobody's going to get hired next week. As a survey. Sorry. So what's interesting is that that was his video from four days ago. He issued new statements today where the, the, the numbers that he's talking about are much more bleak. Take a look. 18% of all households in the U.S. are impacted by layoffs already. Seven and a half million of those are restaurant and bar jobs. And just some of the industries that are getting crushed in a way that they never did in 2008, 2001, or in the oil crisis are just, you, you see these, these are industries that are getting completely crushed. Here's why all of those projections may be wrong. This is what the Federal Reserve of the United States says. Unemployment in the U.S. could rocket to 30% in the next quarter. It wasn't that high in 1929. GDP could plunge 50% in Q2. So I, I'm hoping it's, it's more like 20 or 30%, but trust me, it's, it's a bloodbath either way. And that's because they say this is a planned, organized, partial shutdown of the U.S. economy. It's a huge shock, and we're trying to cope with it and keep it under control. At this point, the Fed has thrown, you know, the way I describe it is they didn't just throw the kitchen sink at it. They went around the house ripping up every single sink, the sink and threw it all at the same time. So I think they're doing a great job, but it's very, very challenging. Okay, so... That's a lot of data. But what does this data really need, lead to? Well, we see two paths, two scenarios. Understanding the scenario is critical to understanding the impact on real estate and stocks. Now, neither scenario is good, but I can assure you one is vastly better than the other. I'm also happy to say that when I wrote this webinar uh, a week ago, scenario one was more likely. Today, scenario two is more likely. Scenario one is that we will not do what China did, what Spain did, what Italy did. We will not shut down our whole economy. We will try the containment and care method where we basically say, oh, well, this area, you know, we'll, we'll shut down New York, but we're not going to shut down, you know, the, the rest of the New York state, that sort of thing. That's what we've been doing so far until maybe about 48 hours ago. And, and then I started to see the states accelerating and, and putting us into a real shelter in place or quarantine. In this scenario, 40 to 70% of the US population becomes infected. Between two and a half million and eight million Americans die within the next 90 days. Scenario two, which is now looking a lot brighter than it was a week ago is, we start pu putting pretty much all of our people in quarantine. And you may not have heard this, but now 17 states are in quarantine, including the two that are starting tomorrow. 17 states, 148 million people. The challenge is there are 330 million people in the U.S., so we still have 180 million people that are not in quarantine. And what happens in the, in the next few days will determine pretty much the state of our economy. And I'm very hopeful that the remaining governors will follow the 13 or the 17 that have already put their populations into quarantines because there doesn't appear to be any math that allows us to not have millions of deaths if we don't do this. In this case, I, I think it's too late for 200,000 infections, but we might end up with 500,000 infections and about 10,000 deaths. Sounds like a huge number, but compared to the flu, it's still fairly small. So I think scenario two is where we are heading right now. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that the rest of the governors will do the right things. What are the impacts? So uh, scenario one is just, Madness. Um, deepest recession we've ever seen. All real estate becomes illiquid. 
Dow Jones drops below 10,000 points. It's, I think it's at 20,000 points right now. Scenario two, we get a very, very sharp recession in Q2, which lasts, runs into Q3. At this point, more people are beginning to understand that that recession is not gonna be one quarter, it'll be two quarters. With the economy beginning a bounce back, not bouncing back, but beginning a bounce back, real estate is likely to benefit from ultra low rates, and we could actually see a boom in real estate in 2021 as the economy recovers. We will see an incredibly large amount of buying opportunities in real estate starting Q3, and I think that extends into Q4. Now those, those buying opportunities will be variable. They will vary between different sectors of real estate, single family, multifamily will be different, senior housing, student housing will be different, and we'll talk a little bit about those. Now, we are likely to see price declines in the coming months, and we'll talk more about that shortly. Okay, it's time to jump in deeper into real estate, right? It's been so hard to get solid opinions from people, but here we go. First, let's get something super important out of the way. You know that the ultra low mortgage rates that we're seeing should be giving real estate a boost. And as you can see from this graph, from right to left, as rates go down, people can afford a lot more home for their down payment. The problem is that rates went to crazy low levels in 2008 as well. And it helped, but it took a significant amount of time. And during that time, it was a bloodbath. And so we see low rates putting, helping the housing market in maybe Q4 and putting a floor under home prices. But over the next six months, we don't see them making much of an impact, if any. And by the way, our thinking on this was echoed by Scott Bowling at PricewaterhouseCoopers. He says that low rates and tight housing inventory will not be enough to shelter the housing industry. And so we've been reading reports, lots and lots of reports. CBRE is the big dog in the commercial brokerage markets and they're fairly bullish. They see property values and sales volume taking a short-term hit, we agree. They see hotels expecting a 20% drop in revenue. That's nonsense. Most hotels in the US have now reported an 80% drop in revenue. For multifamily, they're bullish and we agree, but we wanna point out that in the short-term, there will be an all ships dropping effect, not all ships rising, but all ships dropping. And we don't think that multifamily is an exception, CBRE. We think multifamily will also see drops. In fact, we believe that multifamily is already seeing drops, but because everything's frozen, because transactions are frozen, this information is not getting out to the public. So we looked at their main competitor, Marcus and Millichap, and found their report to be so outrageously bullish in that it looks like a sales manager wrote it. And this kind of outrageous head in the sand attitude is what got us in trouble last time. Now we must point out that this is their opinion, opinion and we've generally found m and to be fair and balanced and give useful information, but we really think that they missed the boat this time. Yardi Matrix breaks the tie between CBRE and Marcus and Millichap, right? Well, they started with announcing a recession, so that definitely gives them credibility. They expect the impact to last three to six months. We think it's six months. They point out that multifamily is well capitalized and should weather a slowdown, and we generally agree, but they do point out that there will be a short-term rent collection issues, and we strongly agree with that. At the end, they advise keeping some powder dry because market stocks could, shocks could result in opportunities. 100% right on that, Yardi. 100% right. As an investor, you have to remember yourself that you've already kicked yourself a dozen times for not buying more real estate in 20, 2009. So keep some powder dry because your opportunity is coming and it's coming within a quarter. Let's move over to single family. I live in California and they, they put out a report which I found to be ridiculously bullish, though they did point out that recovery will take longer. Uh, to me, I, I, I think that they, they did point out that home construction will slow further, which we agree with, and that's a double-edged sword. As new, new home construction slows, the construction industry takes a big hit, that hurts the economy. But on the other hand, less new homes means supply goes down, right? So there's more demand for existing rentals. So, so good and bad, sort of a mix. But I, I feel like these people are still overly bullish compared to what we are actually seeing in the economy. So the realtors, I still think, are in denial. So we had um, here, 61% of realtors said sellers had no interest in removing listings. We're not seeing that. 16% said sellers are taking steps to stop marketing homes. We, we think that these numbers are a little bit too bullish. 
Reduction in physical open houses, they're only seeing a 48% drop, but we've done independent research and we're seeing 70 or 80% drops. Keep in mind that we are in peak selling season. 40% of all home sales each year happen from March to, to, to June. And so I, I, I have trouble, I have trouble believing this data because I think that the, the National Association of Realtors is trying to sugarcoat things and I don't think that they're gonna be able to hide it for long. Here's what we see happening. We see that there's going to be a very significant decline in listings. Sellers are not gonna list homes because they don't want strangers in their homes. They will also be fearful of falling prices. Home buyers will postpone decisions because of fear. Plus they're worried about their jobs. They're also gonna adopt a wait and watch attitude. So you know, expect both prices and sales volumes to be hit in single family. Right now everything's sort of frozen, but when it unfreezes, expect prices to be hit expect sales volumes to be hit. It is all of a sudden a buyer's market, both for single family and multifamily. Now here's my favorite slide and I'm gonna go deep into this and feel free to ask me questions about this, right? The big question is, Neil, which sectors of the real estate market will get hurt the most? And which sectors are going to be the most resilient? Well, it, are, it took our team hours and hours of searching, but we found that data for you. The awesome folks over at Green Street Advisors looked at the stock market and they looked at every real estate investment trust for all of the different real estate sectors and they analyzed them. The result had some small surprises, but they mostly make sense. So let's deep dive into this. Here's the first section. These are the biggest losers, right? And it makes perfect sense that senior housing and skilled nursing would be hit super duper hard. That public relations disaster from that nursing home in Washington that had over 100 cases means that people are afraid to put their parents into a senior's home. Let me ask you this question. Would you leave your mom or dad in a senior home today knowing that coronavirus is circulating inside that home? So it's likely the sector will face new mandates from healthcare authorities about cleanliness and infection control, which is going to drive up their expenses at just at the wrong time when people are leaving. So I expect senior housing to have a very, very tough time and you can see what happened to their stocks. It's a bloodbath. The lodging or hotel industry is likely to be hit harder in the coming weeks because initially these guys were projecting a 40, 50% decline in revenue. It's only this week that they started projecting a 70 to 90% decline in revenue. So I think this number, this minus 36% is going to go up. Same thing for the gaming sector, which is hotels in uh, gambling cities like uh, Las Vegas and Reno, Reno. they're going to hit, hit super hard if the lockdowns last more than four to six weeks because they have huge expenses. Imagine how expensive it is to run a hotel like, uh, like the Bellagio in, in Vegas, right? And then, you know, at the bottom of these, the biggest losers list is student housing, right? It rounds out the top, uh, the top five sectors that took a hit with students being sent home that sector has some unique challenges to deal with in the next six months. However, this is a very strong sector. So I do expect it to bounce back if the students come back in August. In the short term though, there will be buying opportunities for those of you who remember the famous Warren Buffett li line. Be fearful when others are greedy. Be greedy when others are fearful. There's blood in the water right now, people. Moving down the list. In our middle section, the hard hit section, malls are in trouble. And they were already in trouble before coronavirus because of the Amazon effect. And they're not well capitalized. There's a ton of debt. And now they have non-paying tenants in their malls. Bottom line, we see potential for slaughter in this sector. Expect loan defaults, requests for bailouts, and lots of opportunity for those of you that like to do shorting, lots of opportunity for you to short corporate debt that is tied to this sector. There's even more opportunity in these strip malls that are shown here. They're often owned by mom and pop operators and they don't have the cash, they don't have the liquidity to get through this crisis if it lasts longer than a month or two. I'm not fond of strip mall ownership, but if the prices drop by more than 50%, I'm setting up a fund to buy cheap assets to flip in a year. The first surprise in the list is manufactured homes. And that is typically a sector that is very recession resilient. So I'm surprised to see such a sharp decline. Now it makes sense if you think about it, mobile home parks are one level below class C apartments. So their typical tenant only has a couple hundred bucks in the bank. 
So perhaps the market is thinking that they may face a lot of evictions. Sure, but if their stock keeps going down like this, I'm gonna jump in and buy some shares. This sector did quite well in 2008 and might even do a little bit better this time. Rounding out the hard hit group is the office sector at minus 23%. Many of you are going to be surprised to see just a 23% hit. Um, it doesn't make sense, right? But you're thinking this should hurt more. I get it, but I think that it's fairly priced. Keep in mind that the office sector has a lot of small companies that may not pay their mortgage next month, but a huge amount of offices are leased out to larger companies who are not going to default on rent easily or stop paying. I mean, do you think Facebook and Microsoft are gonna stop paying their rent next month? This is, you know, this is a sector that we might see a ton of defaults in the next six months. I'm keeping an eye on it, but most of those defaults will be small offices, not large offices. So once again, I'm not gonna to hesitate to jump in to see if I see big discounts in the office sector, because in two minutes, I'm gonna tell you what I'm going to do with those offices, and that's gonna be my top tip of the day. Now for the group at the bottom, the least affected group. No surprise to see apartments in this list, though I don't think they deserve to be driven down as much as 23%. And the reason for that is we are waiting for Congress to shower money on people. As you know, there's a bill that is about to be passed. It's 2 trillion bucks. And they're gonna be handing 3,000 bucks to anyone that, that has, you know, is, a, is a family of four. I know from 2008 and from 2001, once people pay for food, they pay for rent. So the apartment sector is going to be an immediate and direct beneficiary of that bill. Also in that bill is, is money so that apartment owners that are seeing delinquency can choose to, to, to file forbearance. What that means is instead of paying their mortgage now, they get three months or six months of forbearance. They, they pay that mortgage down the line, right? Many years down the line. And that I believe is gonna bounce this, the, the, 20, the minus 23% and you'll see lower numbers there in, in a few days. In fact, that may have already happened because this, this chart is about three or four days old. Now below that, the sectors that are hit less, they deserve to be there. Single family renters, minus 19%. Why? Well, because people who rent single family homes have more money in their bank than people who rent multifamily especially above that $1,000, uh, $1,200 a month level in rents, they have more money. And also a lot of them are, are white collar. The people that got laid off were the people working in bars and restaurants and, and hotels and in airports. Those were blue collar people. A lot of the people that live in single family rentals are white collar people, so they may not be hit as much. So I think that it's fair that the, this particular area only dropped 19%. Now, life science, and medical office, I wanna focus on this, okay? We, all I'm saying is this, we think that the biggest winners from the worldwide pandemic are medical offices and life science offices. Remember after 9-11, security companies saw insane growth? Well, this time, after the world recovers from this black swan, we're gonna see more healthcare facilities, more medical offices. A larger percentage of our GDP will be allocated to healthcare for decades to come and I'm looking to buy regular offices. Remember the ones over here that, are, that I'm gonna see defaults on in five months, six months? I'm going to go buy those and turn them into medical offices if I can. Immunology, infection control, medical equipment, all of these are going to see huge gains as soon as Q3, and as investors, we need to jump on it. If you're not comfortable buying offices and turning them, you should go buy REITs for, for, for life science and for medical office. I know that they've dropped you know, 20%, but I think they deserve to go up, not go down. At this point, if these stocks were 18% on the positive side, I wouldn't have been surprised. So in my mind, these are extremely cheap and you should consider as an investor, looking at them at these real estate investment trusts and consider investing some money there. Now, there's two, uh, there's one more category in the list and I think that it makes perfect sense, okay? Bottom line, is that I've been harping on self-storage as possibly the best sector in real estate. 
And coronavirus amplifies that. Self-storage has many benefits. Eviction is cheap and simple. And because tenants pay by auto pay, it takes them months to even think about moving out of their self-storage units. They just lost their job. They're worried about being sick. Do you think that to save 80 bucks, they're going to go hire a truck? And by the way, the truck companies are closed. They're gonna hire a truck and go empty out their storage unit when they don't even know where they're gonna put that junk? With all this stuff going on, this sector is just going to be under the radar. So it's gonna to continue to do well and richly deserves its least affected ranking in this commercial real estate list. Wow, okay, that was a lot. But I want to highlight the impact, the stunning impact on hotels and Airbnbs. Like you can see my graphics designer got carried away a little bit, but she was trying to make a key point. The hotel industry is decimated, just decimated, deep impact. For instance, Marriott is the largest hotel chain in the world. They're laying off tens of thousands of uh, workers this week and it's likely to become hundreds of thousands of workers in a few weeks. All of these chains are closing or temporarily shutting down. The travel industry, which includes airlines projected a 75% loss in revenue, $355 billion in total losses and four and a half million jobs lost in 2020. And they are projecting that they will not recover more than a million of these jobs, even at the beginning of next year. Deep in impact indeed. Still Marriott might be better off than Airbnb hosts in a stunning surprise move. Airbnb changed its policy last week and refunded all of the guests, costing Airbnb hosts billions of dollars with no advance notice. As you can see from the bottom left, class action lawsuit is on the way. Note that they did this worldwide. My family and I paid 2000 bucks for six nights for an Airbnb apartment in Dubai starting March 28th, and we received all of our money back. A lot of these Airbnb units have very fat mortgages, and if the traffic doesn't come back for a few months, expect Lots of bargains, really good bargains. Dry powder, anyone? Okay, time for the stock market. Since we are real estate people, we kept this section super short, two slides, but we think that there are some bargain buys in here, plus some stocks that you might wanna consider dumping. And yes, you will get this deck, so you don't need to write this down. Here's a list of companies that you might wanna short, short or sell. Remember, we're not stock market advisors, so use this list with caution. We think that the fast food chains will bounce back the fastest, right? Um, so ESPN and Starbucks and Lyft and Uber could recover fairly quickly, so might be short-term bargains. Uh, airlines, cruise ships, hotels, and casinos will take the longest to recover, but they're also the best bargains of all. My personal favorite is Royal Caribbean International at 78% off its peak. We also think that Airbnb could be hit for a while given the changes in attitudes about infection. So consider shorting that stock. Um, what about companies that will benefit? Well, here's a really awesome list and we've been adding to this list uh, quite a bit. Let's consult your, your stock advisor. So short-term good buys, uh, Kellogg's, Kimberly Clark, right? They make uh, toilet paper, Johnson & Johnson, Campbell Soups, Clorox, all have short-term benefits. And the, when I say short-term, I mean the next three months. So do grocery stores such as Trader Joe's and Walgreens and CVS and Costco and Albertsons. Gaming companies like Electronic Arts, Activision and Zynga are already seeing huge revenue increases. Act, uh, Electronic Arts is actually having trouble keeping its servers up. So these definitely look underpriced. Why should they drop 20 or 30 or 40% at this point in time? Not, no damage is happening to them. So I think that's just the market. Technology providers, Zoom, Ring Central, Cisco WebEx, really good buys because we could see lockdowns in different parts of the world for a year. But the big winners in this list might be companies like Akamai, which powers the back end of the internet, and Gilead Sciences, which is developing vaccines, DoorDash, Grubhub, all the food delivery services, they could also see long-term benefits, so check them out. And finally, gun stocks such as Smith & Wesson and Remington are likely to have an absolute blowout Q2. And if their stocks are negative, they shouldn't be. We will end this presentation with two minutes for asset management. We intend doing entire webinars on what you should be doing to protect your community. So this is just a little tiny taste for you in two minutes. 
our asset management team is working really hard and we're using both offensive tactics and defensive tactics. Once again, this is a tiny portion of what we are doing, but our investors in the call will recognize all the hard work that we're doing. Keep in mind that our communities are well stocked with money and we can go a better part of a year, even if we lose half of our rents. That's the power of cash flowing assets like multifamily and public storage. You've got to understand now the difference between the stock market and real estate. So our first offensive strategy, health assessment. We're monitoring cases on our properties. We don't have any so far, but we know that's gonna change. We've already started researching the right healthcare measures to take in case a resident contracts the coronavirus. We're also assessing whether certain buildings are more at risk and are weighing moving tenants to other buildings. For each community, we're providing tenants with a very comprehensive list of services, grants, loans, local, federal, state assistance. We're reaching out to tenants to inform them of all of these services and when they become available to them. So understand all of your tenants' risk profiles. It's very, very beneficial. We're also conducting surveys to see if our communities have a higher level of exposure to the airline, hotel, travel, or entertainment industry so we can be proactive about that remediation. Leasing is super important. We're boosting online marketing, providing payment options. We're renting units through video tours and we're posting these tours on Facebook and YouTube and websites. Applications are being moved online. There's so much that we can do that a hotel can't do. Take all of these measures, apply them to a hotel. They'll still have 0% occupancy, but not so for multifamily. We're offering concessions going back to notice to vacate tenants to see if they now wish to stay put. Who wants to leave in the middle of this madness? We're working on providing care packages to board tenants, deck of cards, coloring book for kids. We're doing everything that we can to create true communities. Plus we're offering a very powerful lease modification program and we'll be giving you more details on this, but there's three or four different methods that we're using to modify leases to push off rent into the future for tenants that have lost their jobs. On the defensive side, we've canceled all residence events. We've closed all uh, amenities. Coffee and cookies and donuts are gone from the leasing office. Fitness centers and playgrounds are closed. Quarterly inspections are canceled. The office is closed, phone communication only. And we're only um, processing super urg urgent work orders, right? So if it's not urgent, it doesn't get processed at this point. And we're making property by property decisions. Do we keep rehabbing? Does it make sense to rehab vacant units at this point? Well, if we can't rent them out, let's keep rehabbing. Nobody's stopping us from doing that at this point in time. So we we're making decisions on a property by property basis. And finally, we are talking to our lenders. We're withholding distributions to investors. We're keeping that money. We have this rich cash flow and we're keeping it for now to see what the impact is. So far, no impact but we know that there's gonna be impact in April and in May and possibly in June. So we're withholding distributions. We're also withholding asset management fees. We're not paying ourselves. We need that money at our properties. We're reducing, removing every non-essential expense and we are talking to our lenders, right? In case there's delinquency, we're gonna to talk to our lenders and figure out. And most of our lenders have already told us, look, you have trouble, don't worry about it. Just here's the paperwork, send it in. We're gonna defer your mortgage for many months. This means that with mortgage deferment being offered, we can last for more than a year in this kind of bad situation. The resilience of multifamily is truly, truly shining through at this point of time. And that is our presentation, folks. Hope you liked it. What you learned today is a tiny, tiny fraction of the incredible and free knowledge that is available on multifamilyu.com from all those speakers and many more. We're planning 50 plus webinars a year. In fact, we're also planning a number of webinars that we are going to be doing uh, specific to coronavirus. We're, we're gonna deep dive into all the different areas. We're gonna talk about asset management. We're gonna talk about financial planning, new construction projects. So we're gonna do a ton of those webinars. I have a poll up on the screen. Please give me an answer to that poll. I know lots of you have questions. It's now time for us to take questions. Anna, can you help I'm with that please? I'm ready for you. Okay, so um, our first question is saying that the REITs are down 50% in two to three days, and they're saying this has to impact rental income properties, both commercial and residential. It absolutely will. So I think at this point, the fact that we will see an impact is, 
is likely. My point wasn't that there won't be an impact. My point is that at this point, um, we have help. That money, that shower of money up to $3,000 per family, there is no way we are not going to see a portion of it. We are. And the fact that we don't have to pay our mortgage is such a huge deal. Do you think that hotels yeah. are going to get away with not paying a mortgage on April 1st? Do you think that cruise lines will not pay their mortgage? No, but multifamily doesn't have to pay their mortgage. Uh, should I refi my home to get a HELOC? And is getting a HELOC a bad time to do so and why? I think that there's a lot of danger in the marketplace right now. We have very little visibility, everything's foggy. I'd say take out a HELOC in case you lose access to that HELOC. I've done so, just so you know, I, I took a $300,000 HELOC out last week. Take it out, leave it in your bank, but be very careful what you use it on. You can make some really bad decisions in the next 45 days. What do you think of the kill grandma to save the Dow theories from the White House? Um, I think it's insane because they are not doing the math. We are not trying to save grandma. We are not trying to save grandma. We are trying to prevent this thing from going vertical. Understand the exponential function. When it goes vertical, it will take our economy with us. And here's what I'm going to predict. And, and tell, me, tell me it's 90 days from now if that was wrong. There are going to be some countries in the world where this thing will go truly vertical and create the kind of chaos that we have not seen for hundreds of years. I hope it's not our country. So you've been talking, Neil, a lot about um, all these bad things coming, but do these downgrades reflect the $2 trillion package that's being battled in the Senate? So how does that package affect these prospects of the downgrades? It's a huge positive for certain sectors, but right now we don't know which sectors. We don't know how much of this money is going to go to the airlines. We don't know how much of it is going to go to the apartment industry. We don't know how much of it is going to go to other areas like hotels that have asked for a bailout. So it's really hard to tell yet, but I can tell you this, $2 trillion is a massive amount of money. We have a $20 trillion economy. So essentially it's an entire month of our economy that is being thrown at the marketplace. So it is a huge amount of money. It will have a very significant positive impact. The problem is, I don't think all of the negative impact is known yet either. So, you know, it'll balance out. Uh, so will the forbearance for multifamily loans from Freddie Fannie and the stimulus checks together act to bail out most apartment buildings and leave few good buying opportunities when we get to the other side of the crisis? I don't believe so. And I'll tell you why. I read some of the Fannie Freddie documents and here's what they said. They said, we have to look at the previous, let's say February and January's rent rolls and your P&L statements. And then we have to look at, let's say April's uh, you know, rent roll uh, and, and, and statements. And then we have to decide whether you are eligible. So what will happen is there were apartment complexes out there that were already extremely weak and they're going to collapse. So. Do I believe that we will benefit? Yes. But do I believe that there won't be deals? No, there'll be plenty of deals. Remember, credit is also seizing up. Banks all of a sudden want 12 months of interest, um, you know, uh, interest uh, uh, reserves. Banks want a higher uh, interest rate. A lot of people are saying interest rates are going down. Well, they're going down for single family. They're not going down for multifamily. They're going yeah, down. Risk, risk. Yeah. It's all about risk. So will you have plenty of deals in Q3? I believe so. Uh, so do you have any sense when the commercial mortgage market will open up? That's very hard to say. It really depends on how badly we get hit. So, um, you know, that's a crystal ball question. My feeling is that the commercial market will be extremely tight, extremely tight for the sec Q2 and Q3. And in a sense, I'm hoping for this. I think you can tell from my tone, I see, I see this as an exceptional buying opportunity. So I'm hoping that there will be some tightness and, and if there's tightness by Q3, we will see a significant number of properties come to market at a discount. I don't think that those discounts are gonna match 2008, that was different. But I, I think that if I can get a 20, 30% discount, that would be phenomenal. Uh, what do you think uh, COVID-19 will, how do you think COVID-19 will impact your Nova RTP1 project 
You said new construction is more risky in the webinar. It is, but, uh, but RTP1 is a project that's exempt from that for one simple reason. Of all of our new construction projects, it is the only one that has no loan. The okay. investors are the bank, which means that we have no debt. At this point, there is absolutely no delay that we know of. The, the city of Raleigh, the city of Durham have not shut down construction. Keep in mind, a number of states are saying that construction projects are essential. Just so you know, a number of cities and states have already said that. So we may not even get be subject to a shutdown. We'll see how that works. But a four week delay doesn't affect the project much. To me, I think um, I'm very grateful that we didn't take a loan. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask some, some rapid fire questions because we've got lots of great questions, Neil. So here we go. You're ready? Ready. What are the requirements for lenders to give a break on mortgage? They need to see a, that you're suffering. So they need to see your April rent roll and P&L statements and then previous months and be able to compare and say, oh yeah, okay, you're clearly in distress. We're gonna give you a forbearance. One of my tenants doesn't wanna pay. How should I handle it? Lots of different ways. And we're gonna be doing a, a town hall where we're gonna discuss that question. We're, we're gonna have a number of guests as well. That town hall is on Monday and we'll discuss it more. But the short version is you've got to work with them you've got to use different strategies. Remember I told you about extending their rent. So here's a strategy, I'm, here's a conversation I wanna have a tenant. So, so how much can you pay Mr. Tenant? I understand that you lost your job. You know, what's your rent? Oh, it's $1,000, how much can you pay? Oh, I can pay $350, okay. How about that? You pay me 350, now we're left with 650, right? All right, here's what we want to do. We want to modify your lease so that half, we're, we're gonna take $325 out of your deposit. Remember you, you paid deposit when you came in? We're gonna take $325 out of the deposit and we're gonna apply that to this month's rent. And we're gonna take another $325 and we're gonna apply that to next month's rent, right? And then the rest of it. So, so now you paid 350, I apply, you know, I took 325. So now I'm rent, left with another $325 for this month and 325 for next month. We're gonna take those two chunks and we're gonna, you know, apply them to future months. So now you're in future months, not this month, not April, not May, but in June, your rent's gonna go up a hundred bucks. But today, you will only end up paying 350 bucks. Next month, you will only end up paying 350 bucks instead of a thousand. How does that look, right? And a lot of tenants will say, yeah, that seems fair. Yeah, um, we've got lots of people asking a similar question about different markets, but um, how long should we wait to take advantage of a buyer's market, whether it's the Bay Area or, or wherever it is? How long should we wait for to find a, when is a good time to buy? I think that you'll see that. I think that you'll start seeing articles about uh, a spike. And I don't expect that to happen until Q3. This will not be secrets. You will, you will see a lot of financial market articles about them. Uh, what do you think happens when another case pops up somewhere else in the world? Let's say December, will this all start over again? Yes, I, I don't think that this is a start stop thing. I think this is a two step forward, one step back process. So Hong Kong came out of quarantine and immediately had to reinforce some of the measures. The Hong Kong economy is open, but they had, to, they had to pull back just a, a little bit because they were beginning to get cases again. Two step forward, one step back until we get a vaccine. What are what opportunities do you see converting short term rentals like you know Airbnb to long term rentals? Um, a lot of those the prices are so high that it may be very difficult to convert them to long term rentals. Sometimes the, the the rent map doesn't make sense, but if it does, you're going to see your opportunity in Q3. Yes. Uh, as syndicators, what should we be telling our high net worth investors who have taken a large hit to their net worth or their business? Well, I'd like to say I told you so, but I'm not going to say that. Um, instead, I'm going to say that your real estate investment at this point hasn't taken a hit. And we'd like you to go through the next three months with us and see how many strategies we can implement to ensure that you don't take a hit. Um, What's happened in the stock market is not something that we have control over and they certainly don't expect us to have control over it. But I think that they will see proof that real estate as an asset class is more resilient. In fact, it is possible that coronavirus actually reprices risk. 
things like airlines and hotels and restaurants have to sell seats. If the seats are empty, they don't get paid. That's not the case in real estate because our tenant walks in with the intention to sign a year's lease, whereas they walk into a restaurant with an intent to stay there for an hour. I've always felt that some of these instant industries were, oh, that were too expensive. And I believe that we are being validated now. And some of this will come back to us in terms of boost to apartment prices sometime next year. It's a little bit too early at this point. So let's talk about underwriting future deals. What contingencies should be included in underwriting deals and how much timeline delay should be accounted for uh, related to refinancing deals? I think that you will, you will have to underwrite extremely conservatively, um, which is why I believe that you will see lower prices in the marketplace because lenders are going to enforce, they're, they're gonna enforce lower leverage. They're gonna want more interest, um, you know, um, a, a quite a bit of interest impounds, and which is why you'll see lower prices, but then you're, everyone is going to underwrite more conserv conservatively. And I think that in my mind, whatever occupancy you were underwriting for, you need to pull that down 5% if you're buying in Q3. If you're buying in Q2, the question is, why are you buying in Q2? Wait until the dust settles. Uh, where did you get your stats for the infection rates and deaths? Um, so the stats come from a website called worldometer.com, but I wanna show you, and I'm gonna pull this up on the screen because it's a really good question. Here's where we look at this number, and we look at it every morning. So if you go to coronavirusrealestate.com, uh, as this site loads, you'll notice that there's an Excel spreadsheet because we're not just interested in looking at the US. To understand this virus, you have to look at it worldwide. And so as I scroll down, you'll see that there's this Excel spreadsheet with infection rate data. And we look at daily infection rates for the US, Italy, Spain, South Korea, Iran, United States, and also Germany and France and China. And so we compare those rates that gives us a good idea of where we stand. Just so you know, of all of the countries in this list, we have the highest daily growth rate, unfortunately. 36%, where Italy's at 12, Spain's at 19, South Korea at one, Iran at five. So as you see, we're not doing as well as any of the other countries are, but we have a long way to go. We also have a very large population. Uh, let's see. Um... I wanna answer Evan Wise's question. Sure. Evan's a friend of mine. What happens to demand for the units of RTP1 on completion? How does this affect ROI? I expect that the first group of RTP units will come to market in July or August. And I expect that there's gonna be some demand moderation, which could affect us, at, uh, a lot, require us to sell those at below the prices that we wanted to sell. But the remaining slews come much later, and I think that the impact will be fairly modest. So one of the benefits is that that project is a single family project, Evan, from the perspective of the buyer. And throughout this presentation, you notice that I wasn't as bearish on single family. I don't think that they get hurt as much as, as short-term pain as much as multifamily does. We also underwrote the sales price for the RTP townhomes very conservative, yeah. conservatively. We, because we could. I mean, the project had a huge margin, so we yeah. underwrote what, much lower than the market. So we've got, we've got more buffers built into that project than we do on others. Uh, what are chances of political change with recession chances around? And what, what do you think that will affect real estate? Um, I think it significantly reduces President Trump's, Trump's chances of getting reelected. So, you know, um, <coughs> in terms of what that means, um, that's a political question, so I'm going to decline to answer. How does the property manager and ownership relationship change? <clears throat> well, I think we're working with our property managers much more closely now. I mean, there's a lot more calls every week. There's every a day. lot more connection. I mean, yeah, I mean, there, it seems like we're talking to them all the time. Yeah, five or six but, times a day because we have to understand what's happening in our community. It's such a dynamic thing. Yeah, so, but, but they're doing well. I think that yeah. they really understand that they are the frontline folks. And, and I don't think the relationship has changed. In fact, if anything, uh, this kind of, you know, um, catastrophe has sort of brought us together. Yeah, so if you were in a multifamily deal under contract, how much would you need in a seller credit to continue with the close in terms of months of PITI? 
So my, my honest answer, I would drop the deal. Right now, it doesn't make sense to continue with a deal that you're in contract on. I would retrade the deal. You're paying too much. Drop out. Uh, what can you say about some banks that are not lending over $1 million on new loans? They're freaked out. Things will change. Don't worry about it. Uh, let's see. Say if some is starting up now, can we aggressively look for new deals while single family prices are plunging to take advantage of the pandemic? They're not plunging. The single family market is, is frozen. You have to wait for the plunge. I don't think it happens before the end of Q2. What's the impact on student housing? A couple of people were asking about student housing and, and what, you know, what is the impact and do students still have to pay? How does this, the rentals work for students? It's completely unclear. Students, I mean, there's thousands of communities where students went home. It's unclear if the students are going to get any of that money back. There's this, con this thing called force majeure in their contract, which means that even though they were sent home, they may still end up paying rent. I think it's going to end up in the court, so it's very difficult to tell. I have to say, though, that that sector tends to bounce back. If the students go back to school, their revenue will go back to exactly what it was. It's not, you know, even with multifamily, our revenue is going to be a little bit lower in Q3 or Q4 than it was, you know, in, in Jan and Feb. But that doesn't happen for student housing. They're just going to bounce back to where they were. So the big question in my mind is, are there going to be students in, in colleges in August? And I, I have to believe, yes. If by August we haven't controlled this thing, that's the end of our economy. So I have to believe that they will go back in August. And if that's the case, then the, the student housing industry will bounce back. You'll see some deals in the smaller student housing projects. But in the bigger ones, I don't think you're going to see a lot of deals. Uh, here's one um, that you'll love. If the U.S. has the highest daily growth rates, could that be that we have better testing than other countries? There's no evidence to prove that, no. That there's evidence to the contrary that we haven't tested enough in the past, but there's very little evidence to prove that we have better testing than other countries. I haven't seen that. Uh, how do you think construction costs will adjust to new market dynamics? As supply dwindles in other sectors, do you think multifamily costs will come down and are you planning on renegotiating any of your development deals? We're planning on renegotiating all of them because we think labor cost will fall uh, starting maybe April or May. It will start to fall. It may, it may take a while to fall. It's not, it's not a huge disastrous effect, to be honest, at this point. But it'll take, I think some projects will get pushed back, which means that the projects that are proceeding will have more um, ability to negotiate. So we certainly think that it'll be easier to find labor than it was in, in that. And we were anticipating, you know, labor issues. So we padded a lot of our uh, projects. Now labor might be easier. Um, we were initially you know, very concerned about supply of materials. But with the Chinese economy reopening, that doesn't appear to be an issue. We haven't seen prices go up because of coronavirus at all. Yeah. So, so far on the construction side, actually it's a, it's a better thing. Now there is a negative on the construction side and I have to be very honest with it. We do expect our banks to increase our liquidity requirements. We do expect the banks to keep a closer watch on us if the project is going over budget and demand more money, more equity. So we've gotta be very careful to make sure that our projects don't go over budget because banks are a little freaked out. Also, if we were going to get five quotes from banks, I think now we'll get two. Yeah. Uh, here's one. Is there a different recovery rate for the different classes of multifamily apartments, A, B, C? Oh, yeah, definitely. If this is the kind of crisis where A and B will recover much faster than C and D. So mm -hmm. I think C recovers the slowest due to the nature of the crisis. This is a blue collar crisis, right? Because it took... Look at hotels, look at airlines, and look at, um, at uh, retail. All those people were blue collar. It's not the white collar people that got hit, it's the blue collars. So the A's and the B's are going to do a lot better than the C's. If new corona cases, cur the, if the curve flattened by April 15th, just, just assume it flattened, what would be the best place to invest? Stocks, single family homes, or multifamily? a really hard one to answer. Just so you know, the likelihood, the mathematical likelihood of the curve flattening that quickly is extraordinarily low. 
But um, if it flattened, by stocks would have already bounced back by that time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, so the six, uh, Lena is saying it's a six trillion dollar total stimulus package, twenty five percent of the U.S. entire year GDP. We we so, haven't seen any number higher than two trillion. So if that yeah. happened, it's happened today. Yeah. So the money coming from the feds to the families, uh, maybe 3K is only enough for a month, maybe two. What happens in month three? Well, in my mind, it's not 3K for a month. It's 3K sort of for two months. But did you hear a bigger portion of, of the package? A more important portion is this. this. The federal government for the first time in history is going to pay your salary for up to four months if you got laid off. That is a big freaking deal. They've never done that before. Yeah. So who's uh, laid you, off? Nobody's laid off technically if they're getting money. If you were allocating $1 million, $2 million, $3 million right now, where would you allocate the money? <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't buy real estate. I would go out and buy real estate investment trusts for those medical offices. I might buy senior housing too, if they're still at 50% below market. I don't think senior housing deserves to be 50% below market. So I would actually invest in real estate investment trust. And the honest reason why I wouldn't buy real estate is things are really foggy right now. So it may make sense to wait for a month or two to see how it, you know, uh, how it kind of just all lays out. Um, a couple of people have been asking about the tenant resource list for tenants. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that the tenant resource list that, that we are researching are extremely localized mm -hmm. to the city that the person is living with. Of course, we've got links to the federal CDC and you know, federal unemployment uh, and stuff like that, um, or, or the state unemployment, et cetera. But um, the, the resource list that we're developing, um, and, and everybody should develop, needs to be very, very specific to your tenant base and what city they live in. Yep. More uh, questions? Let's see. Are you continuing to raise investments for your projects and do you plan on changing the terms? I don't plan on changing the terms. I am very bullish about real estate. After all the dust settles, not this year, but next year, we'll still have these crazy low interest rates. And I think that people are beginning to understand real estate. So here's a prediction of mine. Two years from now, real estate will have a higher asset allocation for these you know, trillion dollar funds than it does today because of coronavirus. In the long term, a, a, a black swan event like this changes people's thinking. 9-11 changed people's thinking and security became this boom industry for 10 years. I think that hard assets are going to do really well because of the coronavirus. That's my understanding. I am urging investors to be ready with dry powder. There's projects coming in Q2 and Q3 where we will get, we will have access to built in equity, something we haven't had for many years. Do you see any risk of hyperinflation? If so, is it dangerous to hold a lot of cash right now? What do you recommend? So no, nobody, uh, I believe that absolutely no one knows when hyperinflation will hit. I think everyone is in agreement that there will be hyperinflation at some point, but everyone that has predicted when has proven to be wrong. So I simply won't predict it. I'll say it will happen at some point in the future. I know this is a cop-out answer, but I found that hyperinflation is so difficult to calculate that it's better to just say, I don't know when it's going to happen. Um, I'm not sure if I get this one all the way, all the way, but if we believe the time to buy real estate is in Q3, would we be so bold as to use liquid funds like your HELOC for a short time in the stock market? And they were trying to understand if that's what you were talking I, about related to the- rates. I would not use HELOC funds in the stock market, no. I mean, have you seen the level of volatility in the stock market? They, they, they can't tell their face from their butt right now. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any REIT funds that you recommend? 
No, I do not. But obviously, you saw that portion of my presentation. The slides are going to be sent to you. Just Google them, you know, uh, self-storage REITs, uh, multifamily REITs. I mean, there's, there's lists all over the internet. They're, it's, they're not trying to hide. Uh, let's see. So some similar questions about HELOCs. Um, several people wondering about California. So maybe you could just touch again on, you know, what do you think about the market in California related to single family and multifamily? Well, firstly, I must say California is doing a phenomenal job on managing the, the, the coronavirus. Our daily growth rate is one third of the daily growth rate in New York. So big pat on the back for being the first country, first uh, state to go into a full scale lockdown. I think that uh, California is doing it right. And I think that that will actually positively impact real estate here. I don't anticipate California real estate crashing. I think that it will see a decline, but I don't expect that decline to be any different from the decline that other places see. How long there, there's a decline is totally dependent on how the, the full market does. California needs a very strong market to maintain its absurdly high prices. So I wouldn't be surprised if they decline a little bit more than other places. Um, so when real estate values drop, which will have mo more potential for capital gains over the next few years, single family, small multis, or large multis? Hard to understand. I don't know the answer. Oh, okay. Um, do you think it's smart to purchase an auction property right now, or should I hold off on purchasing any rehabs for a few months? I don't think there are going to be a lot of auction properties in the next 45 days because that market is frozen. Um, but especially, I think rehabs are like a fix and flip. This might not be the time to do fix and flips because we don't know where the market's going. I agree. I strongly suggest that you wait for the next 45 to 60 days. There's just, imagine standing with clouds and smoke all around you. That's what things look like right now. Why make decisions that you can just make 45 to 60 days from now? Um, let's see, when are you planning to have the next seminar on asset ma management or can you tell us a little bit more about the town hall? So the town hall is on Monday. We don't know exactly at what time. It's a very different format from this because it is a video cameras on format with me, Anna, and at least one other guest. We've invited a number of other guests. These are people that are you know, blockbuster, experts in the real estate industry. And it is really just you asking questions and us riffing on those questions. Right now, you notice we're just answering your questions and moving on. But when you're in a group of people, those questions turn into discussions. Feel mm -hmm. free to ask us as many asset management questions as we have because everyone on that call is managing their properties. And we can go into much greater detail there than we can because it a, it's a discussion-based uh, uh, event. Yeah. There's no PowerPoint decks and it's definitely on Monday, but we don't know what time it is. Yeah. And I think it's great that asset management is, is discussed like that because there's so many great ideas and new things coming up and it's just so evolving so fast because it is. With, with, when you're doing asset management, you're at the forefront of two, two people that you have to take care of. You have to take care of your residents and your investors. And then of course your, your staff, your, 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 your on the ground staff. So it's a very challenging position to be in. You're wearing so many hats um, and you're looking out for everybody. So um, we're, we're learning um, as we go, very unique situation that we're in. I'm in the middle of a 1031 exchange. Should I abandon the exchange and pay taxes and wait to buy later after the drop? Ah, uh, that's a really hard one because yeah. I don't think that the market will drop enough to, uh, to, uh, to pay for the, the taxes. I mean, you probably will end up paying 20% in taxes. So I'd say probably keep going. I mean, or you, look at uh, not uh, worth losing zones. that much. They could also, yeah. cause opportunity zones will give them a longer window. Yep. Yep. That's so another that might option. Be, that might be a different option for them. OZs might be a great option. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why are industrial warehouses not on the list? That was an interesting one. I expected them on the list. They weren't uh, simply because this particular company that, that put this together uh, didn't look at them. Um, I have to tell you that Marcus and Millichap and CBRE both commented that, that that sector will do quite well. And I agree. Um, Bill had a question early on. It was during the presentation that he asked this. And he says, it's definitely, you, you presented a lot of drastic information. You haven't talked about testing the changes that are being done with the 
mustard resources, massive testing to isolate those infected from the vulnerable. Uh, the more people, testing we do, the better, but there's, there isn't much evidence that the US is doing as much testing as other countries. So how can I talk about something that is simply hypothetical? The, I, I, I just don't see us coming up with 20 or 30 million tests because that's what we need to do what South Korea did. I don't see anybody making 20 or 30 million tests in the next 30 days. Well, uh, I guess this is related to breaking a lease. Uh, what if, can people claim that there, there's an act of God and break their lease? Yes, I, and I anticipate there'll be lots of lawsuits relating to calling this a force majeure mm -hmm. or act of God event and breaking leases. I, I expect that to happen. How much? God knows. Uh, so Patricia's new to this. How do you get your investment funded? So in this, let, let's open this, let's just bring this more to a, like say you're a syndicator and you're trying to um, get your deal, get raise equity for your deal. What are some suggestions that you have in this environment, Neil, besides get out of the project? Like say it's, you've got a good project, you've got a solid project. How would you raise money in this environment? I think you have to understand your, your investors are fearful and fear prevents them from acting. Educating your investment investors on why your asset class real estate is a good investment in these kinds of stressful times is where you begin. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Would you invest in a cruise company right now? Oh yes, I, I, I looked at the shares for Norwegian, Carnival, and um, Royal Caribbean. Uh, yesterday, my son and I did research. I am leaning towards Royal Caribbean. I know that they got a $2 billion credit line yesterday that takes care of their, uh, the four big seas, the ships that they have, Spectrum of the Seas and other ships that, that they have to pay in 2021. I was worried about that. But now that they have a $2 billion credit line, I think that uh, Royal Caribbean will bounce back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this has been touched on before, but it's such a critical uh, thing for, for people that are landlords. Many local governments are telling tenants there's a three month freeze on evictions. Will landlords have to eat the loss of rent during this period? Possible, but don't imagine that every tenant will not pay you just because such an ordinance exists. There are going to be, and you will over the next few weeks, figure out that there are ways to pressure tenants even if you can't evict them. You can still report them to credit bureaus. You can still hurt their, uh, their credit. And many of them will pay anyway because they have the money. Don't expect that 100% non-payment will occur. We're expecting significant non-payment, but not crazy levels. Also keep in mind that people, anybody that got laid off, the federal government is paying salaries. I wanna keep emphasizing this because people don't understand how big a deal it is. The government is paying for your salary if you got laid off for up to four months. Would you really be not paying rent? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the slide, Neil, that you showed all of the different drops in the different um, asset classes, mm -hmm. when do you expect those price drops would be in effect? Like what is the time frame? Uh, I think it really depends on how our fight again goes. Everything I said is up in the air because we have to beat this thing, right? Because if we don't, all bets are off. Yeah. Well, do you think, think that this, is, this market correction was long overdue? Um, what happened with coronavirus had nothing to do with the markets. Mm -hmm. it, it is a true black swan event. We, I believe that if it happened in 2010, we would have seen the same kind of decline that we saw this year shutting down the United States economy, which has never happened in history, has the same impact in 2009 or 2020. Hmm. Uh, so here's somebody who's finishing a renovation on a single family in Sacramento market within the next 30 days. Am I risking anything if I list on the market or should I consider other options like holding versus selling? I would list, see what happens. There's no downside to listing but I would be surprised if you get anywhere close to the price that you thought you would get. Well, Neil, I think we are at time. Yep. We're a little bit well, over time, in fact. I, I do want to reiterate that this, yes, this recording will be sent out via email along with the PDF of the slide deck. And I want to reiterate this. 
In 2009, pretty much every one of the 377 people that are on there regretted their decision not to buy more. Don't make the same mistake this time. We're telling you your opportunity will come in Q3. Be ready for it. I'll see you all. Thank you and good night. And thanks so much, Anna, for taking oh, yeah, care of all absolutely. the questions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Neil. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.